you are about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Direct from the Vero Essien Yahad, a Hebrew Nation radio original program. JSP is a variety show seeking out Jewish and Christian origins, religion, theology and history, and doing so in a fashion that is both educational and entertaining. Welcome to Jackson Snyder Presents. Article, the Shamanic Essenes, Keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Their Secrets. 19th of June, 2020. This comes from Ancient Origins Net. On the fourth floor of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., there is a permanent exhibit that many thousands of people have gladly paid more than $20 to visit in order to gaze with rapt attention at fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls, carefully sealed in climate-controlled glass cases, protected from the hands of an adoring public. They are considered the most prized portion of the museum's extensive collection. Visitors read the story of their discovery and translation and are duly impressed by this precious example of archaeology at its finest. Unfortunately, in early March of 2020, the museum was forced to announce that the entire collection, every one of the fragments so lovingly protected with high-tech equipment, financed by the entry fees of the multitudes of adoring fans, was fake. (laughs) Sixteen fragments form the heart of the exhibit. Each one is a forgery, some produced as late as the 20th century, and they fooled even the most careful collectors. They're fakes! According to the museum staff, there was no fraud involved, Despite many legitimate scholars who studied them and pronounced them all authentic, they are all forgeries. To the museum's credit, as soon as the facts became known, they admitted it right away. In these words, the Museum of the Bible is trying to be as transparent as possible. We are victims of misrepresentation. We are victims of fraud. Part of the problem is the fact that David Green, an evangelical Christian who founded the multi-billion dollar Hobby Lobby chain in 1972, had written of the Bible, This just isn't some book that someone made up. It's God. It's history. And we want to show that. Skeptics tend to be concerned when large amounts of money are spent to verify a deeply held belief in the name of scholarship, and Green funded the museum. Despite the forgeries, the Dead Sea Scrolls continue to fascinate everyone from professional scholars to the general public. Someone knew there was a fortune to be made from this interest. Only an extremely skilled forger could have pulled it off. Someone went to a whole lot of trouble, and it worked. They must have been in contact with the genuine fragments, for only the real articles could have served as models to this brilliant forgery. Nevertheless, the authentic fragments do still exist. They offer fascinating clues to curious scholars. Take, for instance, what's called the Copper Scroll. It's been described as an ancient treasure map, listing information about 64 caches of gold and silver, supposedly buried to prevent the first century Romans from discovering them. None of the caches have officially been found, so they are presumably awaiting discovery to this very day. I would have to add to that with the exception of what Robert Feather has found. I believe he found five of them, but because he's not an official Bible scholar, he doesn't get credit for that. They won't even look at it. But the possibility always exists that the treasure has already been discovered and the caches looted long ago. Most of the Dead Sea texts are written in ink on parchment or animal skins, but the Copper Scroll consists of Hebrew and Greek letters chiseled into metal sheets. Some scholars believe this was a better way to preserve the messages, but this, of course, is only a theory. In May of 2016, Another discovery shocked the academic community. In the 1950s, some scrolls were discovered and stored in boxes to be later sorted or deciphered. 
They were very small in size and extremely delicate, so they went unexamined for more than 60 years, resting quietly in a storeroom in Israel. But in 2016, as part of a project by the Israel Antiquities Authority designed to digitalize the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were pulled out of storage and examined using new equipment. It was not available to the original finders. To everyone's surprise, when NASA-inspired technology was employed, Hidden out of sight to the naked eye was a Paleo-Hebrew manuscript that indicated there were more scrolls yet to be found. Or an Abelman of Hebrew University of Jerusalem was credited with the discovery. It was indeed a significant piece of research. Fragments from the books of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Jubilees appeared. But what was most interesting was a fragment from what was called the Temple Scroll. It contained texts describing directions for how to properly conduct service in what was called the Ideal Temple. This was unknown prior to the discovery. The fact that it was written in Paleo-Hebrew, a very early Hebrew script, indicates that the information was very, very old, but the complete manuscript remains lost, perhaps forever. There's no doubt more information is yet to be deciphered. The work of translation is an ongoing task. What is even more exciting is the very real possibility that hidden away in the mountains of the Dead Sea are more scrolls and texts awaiting discovery. Who knows what mysteries are yet to be found? This raises an important point. The Essenes who buried these texts obviously put great value on them. They were also a very secretive society. What did they know that was so important that they risked life and limb and went to such great pains to preserve them? And even more mysterious, has their true identity and ideology been deliberately censored from the public? The story is a fascinating one, with many twists and turns. In the first century AD, a Roman historian, Pliny the Elder, wrote a book entitled Natural History. He was the first to refer to Essenes in print. According to his book, the Essenes possessed no money, and their priestly class practiced a strict celibacy. But he also said the group had existed for thousands of generations scattered in communities throughout Israel while living amongst the general population. Their main geographical center was somewhere above En Gedi, that is nearer the Dead Sea. In 75 AD, the great Jewish historian Josephus wrote massive accounts of this period. His books, The Jewish War, Antiquities of the Jews, and The Life of Flavius Josephus are still studied today. Oh, yes, they are. He divided the religious community of Judaism into three groups, called Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. The Pharisees and Sadducees are both mentioned in the New Testament, but there's no mention of Essenes. Josephus wrote, that the Essenes lived in a communal existence, ritually immersed themselves in water every morning, and kept a strict observance of the Sabbath. They ate communally and devoted themselves to the rigorous life of prayer. But he also revealed that they had a cult-like devotion to studying. Studying religious texts and preserved secrets, they wouldn't reveal to anyone outside their number. One of the most startling revelations of Josephus, however, was that the Essenes kept a systematic list of angels by name and claimed to converse with them. In summary, early writers tell of the Essenes that they were a highly secretive, extremely religious cult that kept to themselves the better to practice their spiritual lives in isolation, that they believed themselves to be an elite group of Jews as opposed to other Jewish believers. In isolation, they prepared themselves to be Elohim's chosen people as they awaited the coming of Messiah and the building of a sacred temple on earth. The writings reveal that the current priesthood in Jerusalem was apostate, keeping the wrong calendar, they had forsaken the rules of purity, and were improperly officiating the laws of Elohim. One of the most intriguing texts found at Qumran is a scroll called War of the Sons of Light Against the Sons of Darkness. 
This is the text that most clearly expressed the Essenes' dualistic belief system. The Sons of Light were, of course, the Essenes. Apparently, the Sons of Darkness were everybody else. At some point, according to this scroll, there will be a great and final war, a cataclysmic battle between good and evil. This belief is also echoed in the final book of the New Testament, the Book of Revelation. The battle will be fought on earth, but its ramifications will be felt throughout the cosmos. Apparently, planet Earth has the bad fortune of being ground zero in a truly epic war being played out in the spiritual realm between Elohim and Shatan. In this way, the beliefs of the Essenes are not much different than many other monotheistic systems of eschatology or the study of end times. I believe that the 20th century and now the 21st, there's been a great revival of the apocalypse and anything that smacks of prophecy. Everybody has their own take on what it means, and many people are very fearful that these things, these catastrophic things foretold in ancient texts, are for this time. For years, scholars have wondered about the term Son of God or Son of Elohim. That was the title Yahshua took upon himself, or the redactors of the Gospels, gave to him, but apparently it was in use way before Yeshua was born. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, but there it was used to describe fallen angels who in no way could have been confused with the second person of somebody's trinity. The Essenes also refer to a council of twelve, reminding the reader of the twelve disciples of Yeshua. They practice baptism, reminiscent of John the Baptist, who baptized Yeshua in the Jordan River. They also talked about healings, recalling the miracles of Yeshua, and most important, a communal meal. These are all analogous to Christian teachings, but occurred long before Yeshua was born. This has prompted some scholars to wonder if Christianity, as it's known today, is actually a continuation of a Jewish sect called the Cult of the Essenes. Certainly in some ways, though I've just mentioned those ways that they have in common, the Christians of today are lawless. And honestly, so are Hebrew Roots people to a great extent. And certainly the lawlessness has set them apart from these Essenes. I want to emulate the Essenes. That's what I'm all about. I mean not to go off and be celibate someplace in the desert in a commune. They all didn't do that. That was a small group. But even the ones that weren't in commune, highly praised righteousness, kept the Torah line by line, prayed and hailed Elohim continually, not only with their lips, but with their service. Do you think that Yahshua actually is the Messiah for whom the Essenes were waiting? Was he the real son of Elohim and teacher of righteousness? Can the reason that the Essenes are not mentioned in the Bible be attributed to the fact that they never disappeared at all, but eventually morphed into the official state religion of the conquering Roman Empire. Did the Essenes, in effect, really win the war while the apostate Pharisees and Sadducees were killed or carried off into the great diaspora? Now we get into some pretty crazy secrets from John Marco Allegro, who was on the original Dead Sea Scrolls team. He was the only non Catholic on the team, and he died in 1988. He was an archaeologist and a Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, an Aramaic and Hebrew scholar as well. His most famous, some might say infamous, book was entitled The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, a study of the nature and origins of Christianity within the fertility cults of the ancient Near East. Now, I've never read this book. I've known of it for a long time, but this book cemented Allegro's popularity, and it also ended his career. From his work with the Copper Scroll and the other Dead Sea texts, he put forth the theory that when the Essenes gathered to share their communal meal, later ritualized in the Christian celebration of the Eucharist, or Last Supper, where the main course consisted of psychedelic mushrooms. Now, how do you like your shroom coffee, Brother Schneider? For the shroom cough, it was shroom delicious. Would you mind filling that cup again? He believed this was the basis for the Christian sacramental meal. In that sense, the Essenes above the Dead Sea take on the appearance of an ancient shamanic 
sect that surpasses the Hebrew religion and traces its roots way back to the ancient shamanic rituals that may have taken place in the great painted caves of Western Europe as much as 40,000 years ago. Indeed, this may even mark the beginning of religion, as Tevya in The Fiddler on the Roof exclaimed. Forget that part, because I can't even remember what it was now. In his book, Supernatural Gods, the current author puts it this way, when the first humans crawled back into those great painted caves 40,000 years ago, or gazed in wonder at the night sky and wondered where they came from, the human race had finally evolved to the point where the real work of discovery could begin. We were able to think symbolically. We had religious thoughts, spiritual inclinations. We were off to the races and haven't stopped since. We had glimpsed our grail and were off on our quest for supernatural gods. Some anthropologists believe that it was by consuming hallucinogenic mushrooms that the first shamans learned to communicate with the gods. They experienced out-of-body travel and for the first time surveyed landscapes that were beyond the perceptual realm. Many Christians believe they'll go to heaven when they die. Heaven supposedly is the abode of their God. But is not heaven just a word that describes a place outside of this dimension and man's plane of existence? For countless thousands of years, shamans have used psychedelics to achieve visions of such realms. Not only shamans, but these days, just about everybody does. Many report talking to spiritual entities that resemble what the Dead Sea Scrolls call Malachim, angels. The Essenes even kept lists of the names of these beings. Even the most ancient religion in the world? Were they a continuation of the original tradition of shamanism? I told you it was going to be far out. This is why John Allegro, archaeologist and Dead Sea Scroll scholar, lost his job and was banished from the company of accepted scholars. Allegro was the editor of some of the most famous and controversial scrolls published, like the Pesharim, a group of interpretive commentaries on scripture. The Pesharim are especially interesting to me because I believe their first century AD texts and that they are about the actors of the Jesus movement. Back to Allegro, he was in effect censored because he proposed a radical explanation for something that is to this very day still not understood. He put forth the theory that Jesus, who was the teacher of righteousness, was introduced to the world because of the psychedelic experiences of the Essenes, who he thought were shamans who practiced their religion in the region of the Dead Sea. Their communal meal of mushrooms is now kept alive each and every Sunday morning whenever Christians gather to celebrate the Last Supper. Wine has replaced the Amanita Muscaria mushroom. Allegro went a lot further than this, however, he believed that in order to confuse the Romans, the early Essenes sect, who might have morphed into mystical Jewish Gnostics, used code when referring to their meal. They juxtaposed Hebrew with Aramaic, two languages known and used in Israel at the time. Well, he might have a point. Take the famous words, Our Father, who art in heaven. Transliterated to Aramaic, the phrase becomes Abracadabra. No kidding. Might remember that the Emperor Carcalla's physician did his healing with amulets that had the word abracadabra on them. And we still say that today as a word that supposedly brings forth magic. But come to think of it, it's a transliteration of our Father who art in heaven. It's new to me. But Allegro also speculated about the Christian doctrine concerning consuming the body of Messiah. Whenever the sacrament of communion is celebrated, the priest repeats the words of Yahshua, This is my body, broken for you. This is my blood, shed for you. Take it in remembrance of me. Does this refer to the fact that the sacred mushroom was actually a form of divinity? Allegro's career ended with the publication of his book, Sacred Mushroom. According to the academic world, he was henceforth an outcast, a pariah. He had dared challenge the church's well-known narrative 
and for that he was censored. But reading his well-thought-out and convincingly presented arguments, it makes one wonder. Pliny the Elder, the first to write about the super-secret world of the Essenes, said the sect was thousands of years old. As we mentioned before, he might have underrepresented their age. They might go all the way back to the most ancient human religion, first practiced some 40,000 years ago, and their presence might be seen in, albeit modified in garbled form, every Sunday morning when Christians gather to drink wine and consume the body of Christ. In this sense, there might be more to the Dead Sea Scrolls than meets the eye. I should say. Now, isn't that about the craziest thing you've ever heard? It was an excerpt from Jim Willis's book, Censoring God, Lost Books of the Bible and Other Suppressed Scriptures, released in 2021. Jim Willis is also the author of Hidden History, Ancient Aliens, and the Suppressed Origins of Civilization. I need to report this for myself. So, I've held off getting that book, the Sacred Mushroom book, ever since I heard of it, but I think I'm going to get it and report to you what it says. Is this my specific belief about the Essenes? No, it is not. Shamans do not evolve into the holiness crowd. So, hold your horses and we'll find out what Allegro has to say about that. You've been listening to Shroomkoff, hosting the program Jackson Snyder Present, sponsored by the Vero Essen Yahad and Hebrew Nation Radio. Toda Rava, and keep your Elohim on until we get together again. Shalom, shalom. Hopefully tomorrow I'll have my rabbit. (laughs) 